joining us this press briefing on the new Omicron variant and vaccine rollout in Africa. I'm pleased to be joined by Professor Anwon Godberg, clinical microbiologist with the Center for Respiratory Disease and Meningitis at the National Institute for Communicable Disease in South Africa. Professor Juan Godberg will tell us more about the Omicron variant and the ongoing scientific investigation. The world is once again confronted by a new COVID-19 variant of concern. While research is ongoing to know whether the Omicron variant is more contagious, cause severe illness or has an impact on vaccine efficacy, its emergence is a stark reminder that we must double down our curving COVID-19 transmission. An increased number of countries are reporting the new variant since it was first sequenced in South Africa. Ghana and Nigeria have become the latest African country to detect Omicron. Globally, more than 20 countries have now reported the new variant. It is expected that the Omicron variant will be detected in more countries as national authorities set up surveillance and sequencing operations. In Africa, the detection of Omicron variant is coinciding with 54% surge in COVID-19 infection. Um, it should be noted that it is mostly in Southern Africa. While new COVID-19 cases are rising in Southern Africa, they have dropped in all other sub-regions during the past week compared with the previous week. The ongoing investigation will be key to determining whether this spike is driven by Omicron variant or other factors. Thankfully, the speed and transparency by Botswana and South Africa is in detecting and alerting the world to the new variant has been for us an important issue. And it has given to the world an early start in mounting an effective response. We must seize this window of opportunity, act swiftly to ramp up measure to track, detect, control, and spread of the Omicron variant. At WHO, we are urging countries to increase genomic sequencing, ensure that laboratories have sufficient equipment and staff to accelerate analysis, and that screening of point of entry to enhance so that cases are detected early and appropriate clinical care provided. We are also working closely with countries to step up response to this new variant. In South Africa, where WSO has already a team working in genomic sequencing, we are deploying a surge team in Gauton projects to support surveillance and contact tracing. As other interventions such as infection prevention and treatment measure. In Botswana, we are providing technical assistance to boost the production and distribution of medical oxygen. The organization is also mobilizing $12 million to support critical response activities in countries across the region for the next three months. Turning to COVID-19 vaccination, it is almost one year since the world first COVID-19 shot was given. Yet, Africa has made little inroads in the path to providing vaccine protection. So far, only 102 million Africans in Africa, or 7.5% of the continent population is fully vaccinated. More than 80% of the population has not received even a single dose. This is dangerously wide gap. However, in the past three months, there has been a welcome increase in vaccine supplies. Countries must do their utmost to ensure the widest possible vaccine coverage, identify and quickly address any obstacle. Challenges in operational planning, funding, vaccine delivery service as well as communication and community engagement have hindered the effort to widen vaccination in some African countries. To address these bottlenecks, WSO and partner organizations have carried out field mission in countries to help refine and reinforce their vaccine rollout strategies. 
mass vaccination campaigns are not new phenomena in Africa. We have been doing it for over 50 years now. However, the COVID-19 vaccine drive is unprecedented and present many challenges. I thank you once again for joining us and look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Salam. And now I will turn to you, Professor Anne. South Africa has led the world in identifying the Omicron variant. Can you please tell us the latest finding about this new variant? Yes, and, and, and thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to um, share information from South Africa. And I'd like to almost correct, um, it was a Southern African um, effort. Botswana was there, they had loaded almost before we had loaded um, or at a very similar time. So it was also thanks to Botswana that we knew that the sequences um, had to mean something and that there wasn't an error um, and that we needed to investigate this quickly and to talk together with other partners, both regionally in the, con in the continent and then globally. So yesterday in South Africa, we reported more than 8,000 new cases throughout the country, and most of them are in the, in the epicenter of our current beginning of the fourth wave. Um, so we were in an interwave period between our last third wave, which was the Delta wave. Things were very um, quiet, number of cases were very low, and now they've been increasing um, at a rapid rate. And I think that's one message I want to get across um, is that the numbers are increasing very, very quickly. Um, we're up to 8,000. I think it will be up to 10,000 uh, a day. Um, and most of these cases are in hard 10. However, in all of our provinces, we're seeing an increase in percentage testing positive of all tests, SARS-CoV-2 tests being done. And we think that the numbers of cases are going to increase in these provinces. Our last effective reproductive number shows that um, the reproductive number for South Africa nationally had increased and in several other provinces was increasing. So we believe that the numbers of cases will increase exponentially in all provinces throughout the country. Of the 8,000 or so new cases and the many cases that we've identified over the last weeks, we only have a limited number that have been sequenced. And um, just to put it in perspective, we have for the month of um, November, we have 249 sequences from um, the NGSA, the network of sequencing laboratories in South Africa. But of those, 183 have been confirmed to be Omicron. So around 70, 75% of current sequences that we have, and remember sequences give us a delay in information because it takes a while to get the specimens and then to sequence them. However, it does look like um, there is a predominance of Omicron throughout the country and Omicron has been identified um, through sequencing in at least five of our provinces that have sequencing data. And we think the other provinces, we're just not identifying it yet because um, we don't have specimens that have been sequenced for those provinces. Overall, what worries us is that we have a system in place to look at reinfections. Um, so we've we monitor using our testing database, a database that has PCR and antigen tests for the whole country, both the public and the private sector. We monitor the first test and then we can see the other tests as they come in and we call a reinfection, another test from the same individual 90 days after the first positive test. We monitor these reinfections for the beta and for the delta wave, and we didn't see an increase in reinfections over and above what we expect when the force of infection changes, when the wave stops. However, we are seeing an increase for Omicron. And that sort of speaks to the fact that in our population with a high seroprevalence, so where many people have had previous infection, we believe that that previous infection does not provide them protection from infection due to Omicron. It, however, hopefully provides them from protect, provides them with protection against severe disease, hospital admissions and death. 
So I think that's the first message and data are becoming available, um, are being released by the NICD and will be shared, trying to show these preliminary analyses, trying to understand Omicron in the country. But I think that's the first message and people talk about increased transmissibility, but I think in this case, this virus might be as transmissible, its own characteristics, the virus characteristics may be very similar or slightly less than Delta in, in spreading or, or being able to be contagious. However, it's the, in, um, it's the susceptibility of the population that is greater now because previous infection used to protect against Delta and now with Omicron, it doesn't seem to be the case. We believe that vaccines will still, however, protect against severe disease because we've seen this decrease in protection using vaccines um, with the other variants, but the vaccines have always held out to prevent um, severe disease um, and admission into hospitals and death. And that's the reason why our final message really about this variant is to consider the the basic principles of what we should be doing. We should be vaccinating as many people as we can so that they can have vaccine-induced protection. In addition, we should be using our non-pharmaceutical interventions, um, trying to remember to use masks, to use the, the fresh air that we have um, and ventilation and to prevent um, and to avoid gatherings of um, large numbers of people in unventilated spaces. And I think, one message I guess to end off with is that the same things that held true for the other variants, I think to a large extent hold true for this variant. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Anne. Uh, again, we want to appreciate South Africa and Botswana for their transparency in reporting this new variant early enough. So thank you very much. So now turning to you journalists, uh, you have heard from our two panelists. It is your time to ask your questions. To do this, please use the Q&A function on the Zoom platform. Tell us your name and the name of the news organization you represent. And if you like to go live, please indicate on the Zoom platform that you would like to go live with your question. Paul, are you there and ready to go live with your question? Paul, are you ready? Yes, please. I'm ready. Thank you very much. Um, uh, thanks for this opportunity. Uh, so the first question I have uh, is uh, uh, for Prof. And um, the genomic surveillance structure in South Africa uh, has been extensively commended uh, for holding true and being uh, responsive. So if she, I'll be happy if she can give uh, a brief insight into what the current structure is uh, for uh, in South Africa, being able for, from the case detection uh, to sequencing. And you mentioned the fact that 75% uh, of the current sequences latest are Omicron. I'd like to know if there is any reason why, uh, maybe in the way that the where the samples are being, uh, the, the kinds of samples that are prioritized for sequencing could provide uh, these uh, skewing. And uh, for the WHO, I'd like to know, um, it has repeatedly been shown as evident in this Omicron uh, variant that uh, uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions could be uh, a better approach towards reducing the chance of the virus further mutating. But it seems as if the current priority for the continent now is in quickly rolling out the vaccines. So I would like to know uh, what seems to be the major problem, considering non-pharmaceutical interventions are ubiquitous and are heavy across the continent, while vaccine uptake and vaccine rollout are still not as efficient. So what will it, why not uh, prioritize uh, uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions? Uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Paul. Uh, before I come to you, Pro, um, we have colleagues at the WHO Regional Office that are on hand to answer additional questions. So we have Dr. Richard Mihigo, who is the vaccine coordinator. And then we have uh, Dr. Tiano Balde, who is the incident manager for COVID-19 response. We also have Dr. Ambrose Talisuna, the emergency preparedness manager. 
and Dr. Nixie Gumede, our regional virologist. So all these colleagues are available to answer additional questions. So on Paul's question, Prof, you go first, and then I'll ask uh, Dr. Talisuna to talk about the public health and social measures. Thank you. So in South Africa, we have a network for genomic surveillance for South Africa. It's called the NGSA. And it's this incredible partnership with National Health Laboratory Service Laboratories. So those are the NHLS labs and call sentinel um, centers that can do sequencing as well as academic institutions together with the NICD. Um, so it, it covers the whole country. We try and get random specimens from throughout the country from as many districts and sub-districts as possible. So we are trying hard um, to do ongoing surveillance that is representative of the geographic spread in South Africa and all provinces. In addition, um, we have weekly meetings to review our data. So we have weekly updates that are available on the NICD webpage and on the NGSA webpage that um, summarize what we found the previous week and we discuss and think through what are we lacking, where are data not um, available for which provinces, which weeks are we missing? And it's those weekly meetings together with the efforts um, of all these laboratories and all the diagnostic labs that submit specimens to us that make it possible for us to monitor these variants. Yes, there was a little bias in the first specimens that were sequenced because it was a S gene dropout that alerted a private laboratory in South Africa that something was different. The numbers of cases were increasing. They have a one specific commercial assay that is used. It should normally detect three targets. When the CT value, so the viral load is high, all three targets should be positive. If you see that it's a high viral load, so a low CT value um, in the polymerase chain reaction, but one of the gene targets is not detected, we call it an S gene. In this case, it's the S gene that wasn't detected, S gene dropout. This was detected by the private laboratory and they sent us a batch of these to sequence. So at that time, there was clearly a bias and you can see it in our old report from a week or two ago. However, we have now recommended and encouraged all our laboratories to continue with their random sampling. And we hope that the original bias that now exists for maybe the next week or two will be taken care of by continuing random sampling. And so then the, the high prevalence of Omicron should be a reflection of what is truly causing infection in South Africa. Over. Thank you very much, Prof. Dr. Talisuna, please. Thank you very much, Mary. And I really, first I have to start off from the point of commending South Africa and Botswana for having really complied with the international health regulations to notify WHO in a timely manner. And this really is, is in the spirit of transparency and sharing information, which is at the core of the international health regulations. At the beginning of this year, as WHO, we issued a, a guideline for resurgence. And this resurgence really has to do with any, 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 any variant that we are dealing with, Delta, Omicron. And the colleague was asked about non-pharmaceutical intervention. We are saying it is a suit of interventions. In addition to vaccination, for especially the target groups, we really need to do the three Ws, wearing your mask, washing your hands, and watching distance. Avoiding social mixing actually helps us to control COVID-19, whether it is Delta or Omicron uh, variant. So vaccination is part of our momentarium of the intervention, but non-pharmaceutical intervention should continue. And we have issued a guidance on, 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 on what we call a risk-based approach on how you the interventions, now you can scale them down based on, on the kind of cases that you're seeing using the moving average. So a suit of interventions, non-pharmaceutical intervention and vaccination of the target group is still our, our suit, our interventions. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Talisuna. And uh, Gabi, are you ready to go with your question live? Sure, hi, thank you so much for having this briefing. 
Um, a question for Professor von Goffer. Um, you mentioned the sort of higher than expected rate of reinfection, and I'm just wondering if you could go into a little bit more detail on that. Um, how much higher um, is the rate of reinfection in this beginning wave versus the previous waves? And uh, are you seeing a lot of people who were infected actually quite recently in the Delta wave that are getting reinfected rather than people who maybe got infected in the first wave or the second wave, which are now, you know, a while in the past. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Over to you, Tom. I'm... Yes. Okay, great. Um, so it's difficult to quantify exactly how much reinfection because it's so early. And I think we have to accept that these are the first few weeks um, of Omicron emergence in South Africa. So the exact quantity of increased reinfections is difficult to quantify. What we'd like to say is it looks more than what the model would predict and using two different models. And there is a preprint that should be available. There was a previous preprint that was available that described the methodology and showed it for beta and delta within South Africa. And now we should have a preprint available within the next day or so that shows and explains the methodology and shows what we can see so far. For us in South Africa, we need to look at this analysis on a weekly basis to see how does it change and what does it, does it, does it continue to confirm that reinfection increased risk. Whether the Delta variant um, individuals who had Delta infection, I think that's also too early to say. Um, there may be an indicator that people within the Delta variant as well as the Beta variant are part of these reinfections, exactly how many more Delta variant um, individuals or previous that had previously had Delta variant. And I think one thing to keep in mind, this is one indicator and it's using, um, using a modeling framework and it's looking at what we could predict using that modeling framework versus what we're seeing. Um, and we need to accept that there are limitations related to these analyses, over. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ann, for, for that answer. Then we have uh, the next question is uh, from Holly Elliott from CNBC. I will ask you first, uh, Dr. Salam and uh, Dr. Nixi could compliment. We are seeing Im emergence of Omicron cases, particularly in Europe, among individuals that have no travel links to Southern Africa. So do you believe that uh, Omicron has been circulating more widely and earlier prior to this discovery in South Africa? So I'll give you a chance first and then uh, I'll go to Nixon. Over to Dr. Salah. Yeah, um, actually our surveillance system at the global world um, is not perfect yet that when we detect a variant or a virus to be sure that uh, it's starting its evolution. Usually we're gonna detect it weeks after it started its evolution. And also the only thing we are sure about when a country detects a virus is that that country surveillance system is good. That's what happened in Southern Africa. It also discourages more the travel ban because when you are kind of uh, taking measure against a country, it is like uh, it is a measure against a good surveillance system. So the fact that uh, other cases are being discovered in Europe is not unexpected. Um, it may happen in other countries and it is only the investigation that are being conducted that we're gonna know more about the origin of this virus and also the effectiveness of some measure. So some measures that are not evidence-based and that have a huge impact on the livelihood and the economic of countries, I would suggest all the countries before they take it to really think about it and also to respect the international health regulations. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Salam. Uh, Dr. Nixi, do you want to weigh in on this question? Thank you, thank you, uh, Mary. Uh, I don't think I've got more to add into that except to uh, agree with Dr. Salam saying that so far the data is quite limited. There's still a lot of research going on um, 
here uh, in Africa as well as uh, internationally just to study all this molecular evolution of this variant that has been recently detected. And yes, we fully agree that the number of countries that are reporting the Omicron is increasing on daily basis. As we are sitting here, we are even uh, looking at about 22 uh, countries that have reported the, uh, the Omicron. And then the, it, it seems as if the majority of these countries that are coming in now are coming from uh, abroad uh, rather than being here in Africa. So we don't know where it started. And as said earlier on, we still need a very good scientific evidence to study further the molecular evolution of the Omicron variant. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nixie. Um, so now I would like to go to Daniel from CGTN for your question, if you are ready. Yes, I'm ready, Mary. Can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, Mary, my first question go out to uh, Dr. Salam. Dr. Salam, uh, how do you describe the swift decision uh, by largely Western countries to slap a travel ban on African countries because of the new variant? And uh, my second question is to the professor. Uh, why should Africa think or argue that the travel ban is politically motivated and not based on science? Thank you, Daniel. So I will start with you, Dr. Salam, and then I'll call on Dr. Talisuna to compliment. Then we go to Prof. Um, thank you uh, very much. The limitation of travel is a measure that can help, but the impact of those measures in the past has been proven to be uh, really limited. It has impact though sometime. It uh, should be really documented and based on uh, evidence. The current travel ban that are happening in, uh, from many countries toward uh, South African countries are most of the time to satisfy um, I think uh, some ask from part of populations. And also uh, sometimes it is a measure that is uh, easy and that can be communicated well. I would just uh, invite uh, all the countries that are most of the time member of WHO to respect the international health regulation and to make decisions that are evidence-based. Thank you, Dr. Salam. Dr. Talisuna, do you want to weigh in on this question? Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Mary. Thanks, Salam, for that. I, I, I really, WHO issued a, a travel advisory on the 30th of November. And, 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 and let me just quote what we say. Entry restrictions of travelers will really not prevent international spread. They place a heavy burden on the lives and livelihoods of people. In addition, they can adversely impact global health efforts during a pandemic by disincentivizing countries to report and share information. And this whole notion about uh, additional measures comes from Article 43 of the International Health Regulation. WHO issues temporary recommendations whenever we have a public health emergency of international concern. Countries have a sovereign authority to put in place additional measures. But those additional measures should be evidence-based. They should have a rationale. They should be scientifically justifiable. And they should be consistent with the international health regulation. And at the moment, I think we think that really uh, any, I mean, the, the, like Nixia said, and like uh, Professor Anna said, South Africa and Botswana detected uh, the, 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 the variant. We don't know where the origin of this could have been. I mean, really to, to to punish people who are just detecting and reporting is really uh, uh, in, in, in a way like our director general said at, at the World Health Assembly special session a few days ago is unfair. And uh, I think uh, really we should stick to the science and that countries that are especially giving uh, travel restriction should justify that and they should notify WHO why they're implementing those measures. We believe they should be time limited the key measures now, I think, should be really things like screening on departure, screening on entry, quarantine maybe. Those are measures that are easily justifiable because really we can't, we don't know who is carrying the, the variant. So it's really uh, travel screening that is going to help us detect any, any, any of these. So I, I really want us to stick to, to the, the guidance that was really issued a few days ago on WHO, over. 
Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Talisuna, for that uh, addition. Then our next question is uh, from Farai from Associated uh, Press. Uh, this question is coming to you, Dr. Richard Mihigo. We have seen low vaccination rates uh, in Nigeria. What could low vaccination rate in rural communities in a country of more than 200 million people uh, like Nigeria post to Africa's vaccination target? And are there uh, countries with similar challenges of delayed findings and inadequate mobilization in rural areas? Is this uh, concern peculiar to Nigeria or do we have any other country in the same situation? Dr. Richard, please. Um, yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Mary, and thanks for the question. Yeah, in, indeed, the um, um, uh, the situation is, uh, has been described, but the, the question in Nigeria is not peculiar to Nigeria. I think we've seen similar situation in uh, uh, many other uh, big countries like uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, um, uh, um, Ethiopia, South Sudan, where in general, uh, in the rural area and remote area, the uh, uh, vaccination uh, drive has not uh, picked up uh, as one uh, would, would like to, uh, uh, to see. So the consequence of this uh, low immunization coverage, I think is obvious. Um, it, it's leaving a, a large proportion uh, of the population um, naive uh, uh, to uh, uh, protection uh, and, and the risk uh, of uh, uh, exposure is quite very great. Um, and the consequence of all of that, it's what we have now witnessing and what WHO have been saying since day one, I think as much as we give the opportunity to the virus to continue to circulate in a naive population, we give the virus uh, the opportunity to mutate. And um, unfortunately, uh, the occurrence of such uh, a variant of concern as we have seen today uh, with Omicron. So the, uh, the message here really is, uh, um, has been consistent since day one from WHO, is really to continue to advocate for a um, equitable distribution of vaccine within the countries, not only limiting the vaccination in urban centers, but also in rural areas, but also uh, between the countries to make sure that um, uh, we can get that protection, not only within, but also across uh, uh, all the countries. Thank you very much. Uh... Dr. Richard, Janice from Bloomberg, are you ready to ask your question? Yes, thank you. Um, <clears throat> my first question, um, uh, Dr. Van Goldberg, is around your comments um, on reinfection, looking higher than the model. Is there a sense yet whether those getting Omicron after previous infection, COVID-19 infection, maybe having less severity. And what I'm really asking is, could the severity of this variant be blunted in countries that have high previous infection rates? And my second question is um, around <clears throat> the high transmission rates that we're seeing with Omicron and children. Um, most, in most countries, um, certainly across Africa, um, children have not yet received COVID-19 vaccines. Is there a concern that hospitals may see more younger patients with an elevated risk of more severe disease? Thank you, Janice. Professor Anne, do you want to start with this question? Yes, and thanks. Thanks for the questions. So we believe, I think very much so, that the, the reinfections from with in our data and hopefully in South Africa, that the disease will be less severe, and that's what we're trying to and to monitor very carefully in South Africa. And it would, the same would hold for those that are vaccinated. So um, I believe that that would be good news. It would be good for us um, in Africa, in South Africa and globally, if those that have had previous infection or been vaccinated have less severe disease um, due to Omicron. I think children are the unvaccinated um, in South Africa and elsewhere in Africa and also elsewhere in the world. And one hopes all the data have shown that children have a less severe clinical course and we've had some anecdotal reports from hospitals in South Africa that yes they are seeing a few more children in some of the hospitals and admitting them 
but many of them have an uncomplicated clinical course during the few days that um, they are admitted or in hospital. I think the severity question, we need to, a lot of it's anecdotal. Some of it is becoming more systematic. And I think we need to be patient to allow the ongoing analyses and ongoing reports from hospitals to become a bit more systematic and more comprehensive for us to truly know. But that is the hope that disease will be less severe. Over. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think I'm going to throw the next question to you again. And um, Dr. Nixie should be on standby to compliment. So this is from uh, China Southern Metropolis Dailies. Um, I know that Dr. Mr. Tulio uh, indicated that there, there may be shortage of uh, testing reagents for scientists in South Africa because of uh, the travel ban. Is it true that South Africa and other African countries are facing this problem? Will the monitoring of a system of genetic uh, sequencing for Omicron be affected? Then the second question is, there currently sufficient evidence to suggest that the recent increase in case dictation and hospitalization in South Africa is due to Omicron? Have more cases of Omicron been identified in provinces outside the Hotem province? Are there any findings on transmissibility of Omicron? Thank you. Thanks for those questions. So um, the flights, we know that from last year um, when there were all the travel restrictions um, globally, that reagents and getting reagents, getting new equipment, um, does become difficult and we're picking that up now that the flights there are fewer flights to choose from to bring in reagents to bring in equipment in addition to send out specimens and isolates for people to be able to then work with omicron so yes i think it will be a concern and is a concern we're already struggling for flights um, but i'm hoping that the travel bans will not be for too long as mentioned before they should be time limited and as people learn more about Omicron, hopefully it will become reasonable and acceptable to um, open up um, at least many of these flight restrictions. Um, yes, we believe that the increase in cases and admissions are due to Omicron because we can see it on the S gene dropout, the diagnostic PCR, that proportion has increased to almost 95% when using that test. In addition, almost 80% of specimens that have been sequenced in November are all Omicron. So we believe truly that there is a link with the increase in cases with Omicron um, variant. And yes, we have found Omicron has been confirmed by whole genome sequencing in other provinces. In addition, we know that the proportion testing positive is increasing, the cases are increasing, the reproductive, the effective reproductive number is increasing. So we believe that Omicron is widespread in the country. Over. Thank you very much, Professor Ann. Uh, Dr. Nixi, do you want to weigh in on the issue of uh, reagents for the lab? Yes, 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 uh, Mary. Uh, I think what has been seen uh, by South African uh, group uh, related to the, uh, the delivery of the reagent and some other equipment for the laboratory uh, activities, we are expecting that to also to take place in other regions as well. As you know that uh, in the West, we've got other countries that have reported the Omicron. So it's quite a very, very sad uh, experience that we're going to see because uh, we know that majority of our countries, they are still relying on the flights to send the reagents as well to send the viruses to the sequencing laboratory. So that's going to be really a serious setback as far as the, uh, the, the characterization the sequencing and the monitoring of the, of, the, of the Omicron variant in the region is concerned. Thank you, Mary. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nixi. Chantal, are you ready to go live with your question? Yes, I am. Oui, bonjour. Vous m'entendez? You, can you hear me? Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, can I go? Can I have an answer in French? I don't in mind French, asking yeah. my question. Yes, we it's possible. Go ahead in French. It's okay. Okay, but I would like to have the answer in French. I don't mind asking my question in English, but I need the quote in rough French language for broadcasting Canada in French. Uh, 
if okay. that's okay with you. Thank you yes, very yes. much. So, um, I will ask the question in French then. Alors, dans quelle mesure craignez-vous que des pays hésitent dorénavant à signaler de nouveaux variants potentiellement préoccupants de crainte d'être mis au banc par la communauté internationale? Première question. Et la deuxième, sur le terrain, vous avez parlé un peu des campagnes de vaccination, mais j'aimerais avoir plus d'informations sur le bilan que vous faites. Comment vous départagez les problèmes d'accès au vaccin et la logistique de ce qui peut relever de ce qu'on appelle l'hésitation vaccinale sur le terrain, des gens qui hésitent à se faire vacciner? Thank you, Chantal. So I will pass your question to Dr. Salam to answer the first part, and Dr. Richard Migo to answer the question on the vaccination. Over to you, Dr. Salam. Merci beaucoup, Chantal, d'avoir soulevé ce problème des pays qui vont hésiter actuellement à envoyer leurs résultats, de crainte d'avoir des mesures qui vont avoir un impact sur leur façon de vivre et leur économie. Je crois que c'est quelque chose qui est un souci réel et qui peut arriver. Mais je dirais que euh, il, a, il est toujours temps de se rectifier. Il y a quelques jours, euh, on avait l'Assemblée mondiale de la santé où l'ensemble des pays se sont réunis et ont parlé. Ce que nous avons constaté de positif est que l'ensemble des pays, y compris même les pays qui ont fait des travel ban, ont félicité l'Afrique du Sud et Botswana pour avoir un bon système de surveillance qui a été développé avec les moyens de VIH et qui ont été spécifiés avec COVID-19. Ils ont aussi remercié Botswana et l'Afrique du Sud d'avoir déclaré euh, leur situation et d'avoir permis à ces pays de prendre des mesures adéquates. Donc, euh, je pense que la suite, c'est vraiment de se rectifier, de revoir encore et que si ces mesures s'avèrent au moins justifiables un, un petit peu au début, euh, ça ne devrait pas durer et que aussi, si des pays n'ont pas encore pris de mesures, qu'ils hésitent encore à prendre ces mesures, qu'ils voient les données, qu'ils les analysent et seulement ils prennent des mesures qui ont des preuves que cela peut avoir des conséquences positives dans leur pays. Donc, je suis positif. Les pays ont remercié euh, Botswana, Afrique du Sud, pour avoir donné les données. Il y aura des mesures qui sont liées à cela. Et les autres pays aussi qui ont de nouveaux cas devraient euh, les rapporter à l'Organisation mondiale de la santé, comme l'indique le règlement sanitaire international. Merci. Okay, um, Thank you very much, Dr. Salam. Dr. Richard, please, in French. Ah, oui, merci. Alors, pour ce qui concerne euh, la deuxième question en rapport avec euh, la vaccination, euh, il faut dire que euh, les progrès que euh, nous avons vus en ce qui concerne la vaccination de manière générale dans la région africaine euh, sont allés en, en, en augmentant euh, à la date d'aujourd'hui sur en, environ les 54 pays que compte l'Afrique la grande majorité, 53 des 54 pays, ont déjà commencé la vaccination. Nous avons des pays, c'est vrai, qui avancent plus vite que les autres. Environ cinq pays qui ont déjà vacciné plus de 40 de leur population à ce jour, complètement vaccinés, atteignant l'objectif de 40 tel que fixé par l'OMS avant même la fin de décembre 2021. Nous avons également 22 pays qui ont vacciné plus de 10 et au-delà de leur population. Mais malheureusement, il existe encore beaucoup de pays qui traînent où nous avons une vaccination qui est même inférieure à 1 de la population. Alors, en ce qui concerne votre question de manière spécifique sur la problématique entre l'accès et la demande de la vaccination, je pense que c'est un, un mix de deux qui fait que, euh, effectivement, au niveau des pays, les choses n'avancent pas aussi vite que là, nous, nous voudrions le voir. Alors, au niveau de, de l'offre des services, en tout cas en ce qui concerne les vaccins eux-mêmes, euh, après une période, longue période de, de, de carence de vaccins, cette situation est en train d'être fortement améliorée. Nous avons suffisamment de vaccins maintenant qui arrivent dans les, les, les différents pays. Et nous espérons que d'ici peu, il n'y aura plus de problème de pénurie de vaccins de manière spécifique. Mais par contre, en ce qui concerne toujours l'offre des services, 
C'est là où, comme un de vos confrères l'a souligné, par exemple au niveau rural, au niveau même de certaines agglomérations, l'offre de services n'est pas encore suffisante et d'où la nécessité de faire des stratégies de campagne, des stratégies de masse pour atteindre le maximum de personnes. Et enfin, la, 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 le dernier élément de l'équation, c'est la demande des services. C'est vrai que l'hésitation a été un facteur important au début, mais le fait qu'il n'y avait pas suffisamment de vaccins, beaucoup de personnes étaient dans une situation d'expectation de, et de « wait and see », attendre pour voir ce qui va se passer. Et nous travaillons énormément avec les pays pour essayer de corriger cette situation d'hésitation de, de, et nous espérons avec l'amélioration des de, de vaccins, l'amélioration des supplies, et surtout avec ce risque important qui est maintenant perçu par la plupart des pays, que nous allons voir ah, les choses évoluer dans le bon sens. Merci. OK. Thank you very much. Um, I, I now go to Morgan. Are you ready to ask your question? Morgan from ABC, are you there? Okay, so I'll come back to you. Let me ask uh, this question first while you get ready. This question is coming to you, uh, Dr. Nixie. It's coming from uh, Catherine from Reuters. How many countries are able to, to sequence the variant viral uh, genome and identify it? And how are they doing it? Then the second part of the question, Are they using the Tamo Fisher testing kit that looks for specific uh, mutation in the variant? Alpha also has it, which acts as an early alert for positive uh, Omicron uh, tests. Thank Dr. you so Nick much. Yes, thank you so much, Mary. We've got quite a very good number of countries now that have been uh, upping up their sequencing activities. Uh, so far, we can look at about 50% of uh, overall 50% of the African countries that are able to produce their own sequencing data. So when it comes to the uh, diagnostic uh, PCR, where the Demo Fisher is one of the um, platform that has been used by different laboratories, not all the countries, they do have this platform. And then those that they do have They've already, we've already sent an information to all the countries for them to look at their data and see if they've really uh, uh, realized or encounter that uh, S gene uh, target failure for the previous uh, tested uh, samples. And then those samples, we really requested them to forward them for sequencing. And if they don't have any sequencing uh, capacity, they need to forward them as quickly as possible to the sequencing laboratories that have been assigned to them. As you know that each and every country, they do have a reference uh, sequencing laboratory that is supporting them in terms of the sequencing capacity. And then those ones that they don't at all have the sequencing capacity, the procedure is the same. They are, we've been informing them that they need to send their samples directly to the sequencing lab. So the capacity for the Demo Fisher uh, PCR um, uh, platform, Uh, we do have uh, the good thing that is not as little as we were expecting that some of the countries, they don't have this platform. So we do have close to about 80% uh, in, in the region of the countries or the laboratories that they do have this platform that is going to be really helping us to screen out those uh, um, as a marker for those uh, viruses that needs to be sent for sequencing, uh, sequ sequ sequencing as soon as possible. Thank you, Mary. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nixi. And uh, Morgan from ABC, are you ready now with your question? Yes, hi, sorry about that. Um, so I, I've got a, a few questions. I'm not sure how many I'm allowed to ask, um, but uh, one being is, is the Omicron variant moving the needle at all in uh, convincing hesitant populations to finally get vaccinated? Um, what is driving low vaccination rates across the continent? Um, and what level of strain, if, if any, is the COVID resurgence placing on key infrastructure on the continent, like hospitals and health clinics? Um, and are, are, are any particular countries approaching any sort of uh, crisis to that end? Okay. 
Thank you, Morgan. Um, I'll ask Dr. Richard to speak about uh, the issue of the vaccination, and then uh, Dr. Salam can talk about the, the strain on the health system. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Mary. Um, yeah, on, on the first point, um, I think we have seen similar situation happening during the, um, the peak that we saw with the Delta variant, and even before uh, uh, with the uh, Beta variant uh, that was in the region. So uh, whenever there is this, uh, um, uh, all the, the stories in the media, the panic that has been created by uh, the current uh, situation, um, um, clearly the people become a bit more um, uh, um, sensitive to the vaccination. And we are starting even to see now country really um, increasing very much uh, their vaccination uh, uh, rates compared to the, to, to the past. So, Obviously, we don't need to, to, to have a situation by which people are going to be forced on this uh, uh, process, but at least uh, uh, we, we want to see as, this as a wake-up call uh, for many people to, to really uh, take seriously this uh, uh, threat and then get protected as soon as possible. And I think this has been really our message to, throughout. And, and we do necessarily work with country to get prepared uh, in case of uh, a surge uh, uh, demand in terms of vaccination, uh, most of the country now have enough supply to respond to uh, uh, such high demand that we are now seeing uh, are coming. Um, the reason for low vaccination rate are multiple. Uh, multiple. I think we can um, maybe uh, summarize them very quickly in two sides, as I said before, on the uh, uh, supply and demand side. The supply side, um, um, it's mainly now the issue of the uh, system to deliver the vaccine. It's not the vaccine anymore that are now becoming uh, available. It's the system to deliver the vaccine um, um, uh, in countries that have all, all, all uh, previous systems that were not very able to do that. I think we are seeing a very, very uh, uh, difficult time to deliver that. But again, we are now building on the past experience with both measles campaign, polio campaign, to use such strategy to overcome some of these delivery uh, challenges that um, uh, we are seeing in few countries. And then finally, on the um, uh, demand side, um, there has been indeed uh, the uh, effect of um, uh, uh, rumors and uh, misinformation uh, that has been spread throughout the uh, social media. Um, and, and that has had an, an effect on the uh, demand of the services. But as now the risk perception becoming high, we are seeing things changing, the dynamics changing. Uh, people now uh, uh, are seeing this as a real threat and then trying really to uh, get vaccinated uh, in most of the, the places. And we are working. We are working with the country through uh, uh, addressing the epidemics, but also trying to use vaccine champions to, uh, uh, from within the community to actually educate uh, mobilize, advocate for vaccination in different countries. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Richard. And uh, Dr. Salam, to you on the potential health system strain due to Omicron. Thank you very much. Out of the five sub-regions in Africa, it is only the southern part of uh, Africa where there is an increase, a net increase of cases during the last week, 552%. Um, in the southern part of Africa, given that increase that is not uh, yet um, uh, over the capacity of many countries, we are working with them to make sure that uh, it uh, will be able to be taken care of. For example, in Botswana, um, WSO is working with the government to increase the oxygen uh, capacity. For the other sub-region of Africa, um, the four other sub-region, um, the last week uh, uh, was a, a decrease in the number of cases. So there is not a big constraint on the health system, but this is at the sub-region level. There is possible that there is some specific countries that may have a specific issue. Whatever is the situation, WSO has just to finish a plan of readiness for each of those uh, countries, what they should be do, what they should do in order to be ready when uh, Omicron arrive and there is the 
um, sudden increase in the number of cases. And that uh, plan will be shared with the partners next week. And uh, we will uh, get also feedback uh, from uh, the countries um, to make sure that it is an appropriate plan and make sure also that it is uh, implemented. Our incident manager for COVID for the regional level, Cherno, I think is uh, on the line. He may go for specific uh, answers in case that there is uh, some countries uh, that have uh, issues uh, in uh, hoping uh, with uh, this uh, situation. Dr. Bade, any addition from you? Yes, thank you so much. I think that we are, what we have really observed is uh, for the moment, not uh, attention within, I mean, the, uh, the, the hospitalization, I mean, and also the, the, the health system, I mean, capacities. This has not been, I mean, seen as a major tension, including today in South Africa. And based on the latest uh, data that we have only almost 4.1% of the ICU beds, I mean, are currently occupied by the COVID-19 patients. That is in South Africa, where we are having these major upsurge of cases. And let's just also keep in mind that uh, this situation has been evolving for the past two years now. And Africa at the moment has been able at least to cope in one way or another, I mean, with all of these upsurge of cases. During the last third wave, we saw a major upsurge of cases in Southern Africa and East Africa, but in Central and West Africa, I mean, the cases were quite a little bit low. And we did not really face this major tension. And if that tension happened also, the duration of that tension was quite very, very, very short. So I do think, uh, as the director said, that really there are different measures currently which are being implemented for reinforcing the readiness capacities of our member state countries, but also of our partners for really being able to cope with this uh, current situation. So thanks to you, uh, back to you, uh, Mary. Thank you very much for that uh, useful addition, Dr. Baudi. So this question is coming to you, uh, Prof. Uh, could you explain a bit more why you believe the population is more susceptible to Omicron? And what uh, does it mean in terms of spread and potential severity of illness? So the question is coming from Christine, from Dutch Press. So we think the population is susceptible because we know that the serum prevalence is high in the country, in different parts of the country after the third wave, after the Delta wave, we've had high serum prevalence, so natural infection has occurred, so much, much higher than the vaccination rate, so we know that people are protected either from natural infection or vaccine, and yet they are becoming sick, and we see that with the reinfection data analysis. I believe we don't know yet fully what about the severity, but as discussed before, we believe that they are still protected from severe disease and symptomatic disease requiring admission. Um, but we need to wait for one or two weeks longer to see what's going on to allow for the clinical course of these cases. Over. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ahn. And uh, I'm coming back to you, uh, Dr. Baudet. Please uh, answer this question in French. What measures have been taking place in uh, West Africa, which seems to be the next big outbreak of uh, Omicron? Um, do other countries um, outside Nigeria and Ghana, have, have they taken uh, measures that, are, that has affected, have they taken measures and are they affected by the new variants? Answer in French, please. Yeah, oui, merci Marie. Donc oui, merci beaucoup pour la question. Je pense que au niveau du bureau régional de l'OMS ici, nous sommes en train d'avoir cette perspective régionale, donc de suivre véritablement l'évolution de tous les cas dans toute la région, donc y compris à la, les, les pays d'Afrique de l'Ouest et aussi les pays d'Afrique centrale. Vous savez, comme je le disais tantôt, on, ça fait deux ans qu'on est dans cette épidémie-là. On a développé vraiment des mécanismes et des, et des, et des outils pour pouvoir détecter toutes les différentes augmentation. Euh, quand il y a eu ce cas qui a été détecté en Afrique du Sud, euh, le bureau régional de l'OMS a eu à, à développer très, très rapidement donc, une uh, guidance note, donc vraiment un document technique pour pouvoir donc, accompagner les pays, tous les pays, y compris ceux de l'Afrique de l'Ouest et de l'Afrique centrale, en français et en anglais, pour pouvoir donc, détecter les premiers cas, donc à pouvoir recalibrer aussi uh, les équipements qu'ils ont pour pouvoir détecter donc, uh, ce, ce nouveau variant-là. Donc, cette action, elle est en cours et le docteur Salam le disait tout à l'heure aussi, on est 
train de finaliser donc ce plan de préparation, sachant qu'on avait déjà un œil sur ces pays-là. Donc, évidemment, donc la surveillance ici, là, la détection de ces cas-là, une augmentation, euh, quelle que, quel, quel que soit la cause, donc elle est, elle est actuellement en cours, ça c'est en cours, et aussi donc le renforcement de ses capacités de réponse en termes d'oxygénothérapie, donc en termes donc, de production un peu de cet oxygène et de la distribution pour pouvoir traiter les patients sévères ou bien les, les patients critiques, cela aussi est en cours. Et comme on l'a dit en introduction, l'OMS a mobilisé environ 12 millions de dollars pour pouvoir vraiment avoir une réponse optimale dans tous les 47 pays donc de le bureau, couvert par le bureau régional afin d'avoir donc cette capacité-là de réponse pour les trois prochains mois. On sait qu'il y a deux risques importants ici. Aujourd'hui, on a le Omicron, mais en plus de ça aussi, on a la période donc de la fin d'année. Donc, c'est deux risques qui sont très importants sur lesquels nous avons anticipé autant que possible, donc pendant les derniers mois ici, qu'on s'est mis à se préparer donc autant que possible pour pouvoir ne pas avoir vraiment de gap et d'interruption dans les capacités de réponse. Donc, je crois que c'est un travail continu, c'est un travail qui est en cours et nous invitons évidemment, comme on l'a toujours dit, le World Society approche. Donc, il faudrait que l'on travaille tous ensemble, que ce soit dans la sensibilisation, dans l'offre de soins et de services donc, médicaux spécifiques donc, pour pouvoir lutter dans son les conséquences de cette maladie-là. Uh, thank you, Mary. Merci beaucoup, Dr. Baudet. So this question is coming to you. Uh, I'll start with you first, Dr. Nixi, and uh, Prof could uh, weigh in on this uh, question. Two high-risk uh, variants of concern emerged in South Africa in recent months, uh, Beta and Omicron. So does this country have specific characteristics that lead to the emergence of uh, problematic variants? And for example, has the presence of uh, HIV AIDS and immunocompromised population uh, contribute to the emergence of these uh, new variants or are there any other specific reasons? So let me start with you, Dr. Nixi, and then uh, yeah. Prof. Wei. Thank you so much, Mary. Um, I, th I think this is expected, uh, especially for the immunocompromised population to be really so much susceptible to any kind of disease. It might not be HIV alone. We can also think of all other underlying, underlying uh, conditions that those people that are really immunocompromised, they might expose themselves into. So as you know that in the Southern part of the continent, the, uh, uh, I think also let me just say in the entire Africa continent, we know that we've got quite a high rate of uh, people that are really having the immunocompromised, uh, that kind of a population. So these are the kind of people that they really that, that having a serious or exposed to risk to really have a tendency of prolonging the excretion of any virus that, manage, that they are having in their system. Um, as far as the studies that are connecting the new variant that is uh, a topic currently with the situation or the status of the population, I'm not sure whether, Prof, are they really having any uh, findings or any latest uh, um, uh, results relating the, the Omicron together with the immunocompromised population that might be present or that is present in, in the Southern or especially also in South, in South Africa. Maybe Prof, you can add more into that, over. Thank you, Dr. Nixi. And Professor Ann? No, we don't have any data. And I think, um, I think Nixi has answered the question to some extent that immunocompromised individuals may shed the virus for longer. We've had data that some shed for longer, but there are no changes in mutations. Some other data that there are changes and these viruses mutate over time, but there've also been exactly the same data for um, uh, patients that are immunocompromised in the United States and in Europe. So there are many case reports. And so that is one hypothesis. I think another reason why we have detected some of these variants is, in South Africa is we have a very systematic and good surveillance system um, with sequencing and to remind everyone that other variants of concern and variants of interest have been detected at least for the first time in other countries. Over. Thank you, Prof. And this question is coming uh, to you from uh, Lindsay from New York Times. Uh, Dr. Salam, I'll start with you. And then the second part, I would like uh, Professor Anna to answer. Uh, with increase in uh, cases in Africa, for those 
um, outside of countries where Omicron has been dictated? How are we going to know if this is uh, being driven by the new variant? And can we say yet what danger this poses for the millions of Africans still unvaccinated? And then the second part of the question I would like uh, Prof. Anne to answer, uh, do we know how many vaccinated people contracted the Omicron variant and who are hospitalized in South Africa or Botswana? So let me start with you, uh, Dr. Salam. Thank you very much. There is over 1 billion African, among them uh, a little bit more than 100 million that are uh, vaccinated. Um, the rest are still not protected enough. May some be uh, infected previously, but uh, they are not protected enough. And as uh, Dr. Ahn and Professor Ahn said at the beginning, um, this uh, variant uh, and the protection that you got from uh, previous infection has a little impact. So it means that uh, in Africa, um, we need to have the vaccine to be vaccinated. And at the country level, when it arrives, as uh, already my colleague uh, uh, Mihigo said, uh, it has to be equitably div uh, uh, divided within the country. It should not uh, stay at the urban level. It should go beyond and at the rural level also. The uh, uh, information uh, that uh, is going to the population um, should be the right information and should be available to make sure that uh, the African countries are vaccinated. And uh, there is the public health and social measure that are very important and uh, beyond all the measures that are available and people should be adopting it uh, at all time. So we do believe that it is a risk uh, as uh, COVID had been in Africa and uh, the measure that was being taken at the beginning can continue and be reinforced. In terms of detection to the, at the laboratory level, we are working with the countries. At the beginning of COVID, only two countries was able to detect the COVID. We were able to work with them, and now all the African countries are able to do the detection. In terms of uh, sequencing also, um, we are working uh, with the African countries, and over 50% of the countries are able to do their own uh, genomic uh, sequencing. And we will continue that work. Those who are not able to do the genomic sequencing, there is uh, a work uh, that WSO Afro and Africa CDC are doing to make sure that the sample are collected and transported to the countries they are able to do the genomic uh, sequencing. So work is being done, there is a high risk, uh, and there is the international solidarity that are needed to make sure that uh, um, population are protected and it is all the population. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Salam and uh, uh, Prof. An, please. Yes, so there are vaccinated people. In fact, you can imagine every traveler that has been detected to have Omicron um, worldwide, most of them, if not all of them, have all been vaccinated. They have one dose, two doses, three doses, four doses, because they need to show proof of vaccination. And we know anecdotally in South Africa, some of the cases that have occurred were also vaccinated. It's too early, however, for any systematic analyses at the moment. Over. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Prof. So uh, we are coming to the end of uh, the press briefing. Um, I'll give our panelists uh, one minute to talk about their uh, last uh, message or final thoughts. Uh, I'll start with you, uh, Professor Ann, but uh, in your closing, if you can comment on uh, Sarah Jervin's uh, question from Devex, can you please talk about the implications for the trajectory of the pandemic on the African content and its management if people are not protected from Omicron variants if they had prior infection with other variants. So you answer this question and then bring in your, your final thoughts and then I'll go to Dr. Salah. I think, I think what happens in Africa will be similar to what is happening, happening in South Africa. We need to monitor and observe the increasing cases. But I'm hoping that as we are noting that even those with natural infection, those that have been vaccinated, they may become infected but may not have disease or may not have severe disease, so it do, do not become symptomatic. And I think that is what we need to monitor. And I think I would like to close off by saying that a lot is unknown. Um, we don't know all the answers to the questions that are coming through. 
we have some hypotheses, we have some thoughts, but it's early days. And I think we all need to monitor the data as they come out. We need to talk um, and brainstorm about what is happening, um, have the experts interrogate the data. Um, and I, I'm hoping that we work quickly, quickly to understand um, the variant and quickly to hopefully open up borders again and allow for people to move between countries. Over. Thank you very much, Professor Anne. And now to you, Dr. Salam, for your final message. All the journalists who attended uh, this uh, press uh, conference. Um, I'm just going to start to say that over 40 years ago, the global solidarity through PEPFAR, through Global Fund, was able to help African countries, particularly South Africa and Botswana, to develop their health system, particularly their surveillance system. That's why they were able to detect very early the Omicron, to be able to sequencing. And in a good faith, um, they share their information with the rest of the world because they have confidence on them. They trust them and they were there when they were in a very difficult situation with the HIV pandemic. And today I do believe that, uh, that uh, international solidarity should continue and really show that uh, what we have started with HIV, we are able to continue it. And the way we are able to continue it is uh, for any travel restriction to make sure that it is evidence-based and it is time limited. And the global solidarity has been also expressed during the World Health Assembly the last three days where people were there and they thank Botswana, South Africa and all the Southern African country for the work being done and for their surveillance system. They continue this process and translate it into act and into decisions and make sure that uh, everybody is protected against this virus. We are all protected or we are not protected. At the individual level, we are coming through the end of year um, uh, holidays and people will want to get together with their families and friends. But uh, we should be aware that COVID is still here and uh, there is some social uh, measures that are uh, effective um, take your distance over one, met, uh, one meter and uh, have masks that are well fitted, wash your hand and avoid crowded and uh, the places uh, that are uh, not well ventilated. And also particularly get vaccinated or if you have anybody around you who is not vaccinated, work to convince them to get vaccinated. Thank you very much, everybody. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Salam. I would like to use this opportunity to say a very big thank you to our great panelists and also to um, our journalists that uh, are always here with us uh, since the beginning of uh, the pandemic. Thank you for, for taking out the correct information. We appreciate you. You're also contributing a lot to the fight against uh, COVID-19. So we are going to have a French session uh, for now. Uh, Dr. Salam and Dr. Richard Mihigo will be around for some few minutes to answer additional questions. We have a number of questions in, in French. Um, so, so just hold on the journalists, uh, uh, the, the French journalists, hold on. Uh, Dr. Salam and Dr. Richard will be there to answer your questions. For the rest of us, I just want to wish you a, a very good day and uh, do have a, a great uh, end of the week. Thank you. Donc bonjour à tout le monde, euh, c'est Kadija Diallo, je suis euh, chargée de la communication au bureau régional de l'OMS. Je voulais donc euh, continuer pour la session en français. Euh, docteur Mihigo et docteur Gay, êtes-vous connectés s'il vous plaît? Oui, nous sommes connectés. D'accord. D'accord, donc bonjour aux journalistes, bonjour euh, docteur Gay et docteur euh, Mihigo. Euh, donc, à l'attention des journalistes, Dr Abdou Salam Gay est le directeur régional pour les urgences sanitaires au bureau régional. Et Dr Richard Mihigo, il est le coordonnateur du programme de vaccination et de mise au point des vaccins au bureau régional de l'OMS pour l'Afrique. Donc là, nous n'avons pas beaucoup de questions, mais donc nous, a, nous allons juste répondre à ces deux questions. Et après, je vous demanderai, s'il vous plaît, de juste partager euh, quelques mots euh, à l'attention de, de journalistes francophones. Donc, tout d'abord, euh, Dr. Abdou Salam, vous avez une question de Fatou Wad, de 7 TV au Sénégal. Euh, elle voudrait savoir à quoi peut, peut, peut s'attendre le Sénégal avec le variant Omicron au vu de l'expérience de Delta. À vous, Dr. Gay. 
Merci beaucoup. Euh, comme euh, nous l'avons déjà dit, la variante Omicron a été détectée en Afrique du Sud et qui a beaucoup de mutations. Et actuellement, euh, les recherches sont en cours, mais il y a certains éléments qui nous laissent penser que cette variante a une capacité de transmission euh, assez élevée, euh, au moins plus élevée que la capacité de transmission de Delta. On sait aussi que, on a aussi des informations sur le fait que une infection euh, avant, euh, ne protège pas complètement contre la réinfection à Omicron. En ce qui concerne la vaccination, la vaccination aussi ne, ne protège pas complètement contre l'infection à Omicron. Cependant, il euh, y a des informations qui nous laissent penser que la vaccination protège contre les maladies sévères et la mort. Ça, c'est la réalité au niveau général et je pense que ça devrait être aussi la réalité au niveau euh, du Sénégal. Ce qu'il faut faire, c'est que le pays lui-même, et nous sommes en concertation avec les autorités sénégalaises, est en train de travailler pour renforcer leur système de surveillance, de contrôler encore le système de prise en charge des malades, surtout des malades sévères, ce qui peut arriver avec la variante Omicron. Notre expérience, de façon générale, avec le Sénégal et avec aussi tous les pays africains, et que nous avons pu gérer les cas. D'abord, le nombre de cas n'a pas été aussi élevé qu'on le prédisait dans les pays africains. Et aussi les vagues qui arrivaient, qui arrivaient parfois aussi avec des décès qui ont pu submerger des systèmes de santé, n'ont pas duré très longtemps et ils ont baissé euh, immédiatement. Donc, euh, le Sénégal, euh, comme à l'instar des autres pays, euh, peut renforcer sa euh, préparation et nous sommes toujours là pour travailler ensemble. D'accord, euh, merci, Dr. Gay. Euh, juste une question, donc, euh, on a d'autres questions qui viennent d'arriver. Euh, à l'attention de Dr. Mihigo, euh, une question sur la vaccination. À l'état actuel des connaissances euh, sur euh, Omicron, jusqu'à quel niveau euh, les personnes vaccinées sont-elles protégées, s'il vous plaît? À vous, Dr. Mihigo. Okay, merci, euh, euh, Kalika. Euh, je, je pense que nous, nous, comme ça a été dit hein, depuis le début, hein, nous sommes encore au début hein, de, euh, de cette nouvelle vague d'infection avec Omicron, on est encore en train d'évaluer effectivement quel pourrait être l'impact de ce nouveau variant sur la protection ou la vaccination. Mais ce qui est clair, et d'ailleurs pour compléter ce que le docteur Gay a dit tout à l'heure, quand nous regardons les cas qui ont été jusque-là rapportés en Afrique du Sud, Bien que, euh, en termes d'infectiosité, ce, ce variant semble plus transmissible que à, à, à ses pré, 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 que les autres, euh, il est clair que les formes sévères et, et, et ne sont pas si évidentes que ça. Et je voudrais rappeler que l'objectif primordial de la vaccination reste à, à de protéger contre les formes graves, à, mais également éviter à ce que à, les hôpitaux ne soit submergé ou à entraîner le décès. Donc, à l'état actuel des connaissances, ce qu'on peut dire, c'est que la vaccination reste une stratégie importante, même dans la lutte contre ce nouveau variant au Omicron, et qu'il est important que les populations continuent à se faire vacciner. Ce n'est que comme ça que nous pourrons réellement mettre fin à cette vague. OK. Euh, une autre question de vaccination de France Info qui vient de nous arriver, de Falila Badamassi de France Info. Elle voudrait savoir est-ce qu'il y a un lien avéré entre le développement de variants et l'inégalité vaccinale. Et elle poursuit sa question en disant quelle est la dangerosité de la situation pour l'Afrique où vivent les personnes les moins vaccinées aujourd'hui contre la COVID-19 et donc pour les autres régions du monde. À vous, Dr. Migo. Euh, le, le lien entre, le lien entre euh, la survenue de, de, de nouveaux variants et euh, l'inégalité euh, vaccinale euh, ne, ne, ne peut à démontrer. Euh, je pense que, euh, et d'ailleurs, ce n'est pas le cas uniquement pour euh, euh, ce virus contre la, de la COVID. Nous le savons déjà, nous le savions déjà avec les autres formes de maladies virales, 
Le plus vous laissez un virus circuler dans une population qui n'est pas vaccinée, qui n'est pas protégée, nous avons l'expérience chez les enfants avec la rougeole, etc., le plus vous donnez la possibilité à un virus de, de, de changer et, et, et de muter. Donc, euh, la, la, la grippe saisonnière est, est un cas parlant et maintenant, des, le, la COVID nous a réellement démontré cela. Donc, euh, la, la, la solution réelle, je pense que dès le début, nous l'avons dit, pour euh, réellement lutter contre les variants, c'est effectivement de protéger la, la population. C'est d'être sûr que la majorité des personnes euh, est vaccinée et qu'on donne très peu d'opportunités au virus de continuer à circuler librement et euh, effectivement à, à pouvoir muter pour aller, aller de l'avant. Alors, en ce qui concerne la, la, la dangerosité, vous pouvez un peu répéter la deuxième question, s'il vous plaît? Oui, euh, elle a demandé, je vais vous dire exactement la question, quelle est la dangerosité de la situation pour l'Afrique où vivent les personnes les moins vaccinées aujourd'hui contre la COVID et donc pour les autres régions du monde? Oui, euh, c'est vrai que, euh, et, et d'ailleurs le docteur Gay l'a souligné également, euh, l'Afrique euh, a plutôt, plutôt euh, résisté mieux à, à ces différentes vagues de, de, des maladies que, 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 que ne le prévoyaient euh, à, à les différentes statistiques à, au début de cette pandémie. Il y a eu plusieurs facteurs qui, qui, qui sont à la base de, de cela. Et, et, et les études de séroprévalence qui ont été menées dans notre continent montrent également qu'une grande partie de la population, dans certaines contrées, jusqu'à entre 40 et au-delà, sont déjà rentrés en, en, en contact avec le virus, ont, ont, ont des signes de, 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 de contact avec la, la, la maladie, mais ont fait plutôt des formes moindres, des formes asymptomatiques, moins dangereuses de la maladie. Mais nous ne pouvons pas laisser cela à la chance. Je pense qu'il est important que, éventuellement, pour éviter les formes graves, surtout dans les populations vulnérables, les personnes âgées, les personnes avec des comorbidités, que la seule réelle protection ne soit pas une protection passive, mais plutôt une protection active avec la vaccination. Et ce n'est que comme ça que nous pourrons réellement juguler le flux de ces, ces nouveaux, nouvelles vagues et, et protéger le maximum de populations contre la maladie. Merci, euh, Dr Migo. Nous avons une dernière question euh, de Chantal Srivastava de Radio-Canada. C'est une nouvelle question qu'elle nous fait parvenir. Elle demande euh, quel est le lien entre le variant et le VIH? Est-ce que, euh, je ne sais pas, le, le variant, je ne sais pas si c'est Omicron seulement, mais en tout cas, les variants peut-être de la COVID en général et le VIH? C'est la question qu'elle pose. Donc, euh, je ne sais pas, est-ce que oui. vous pensez peut-être… Ben, écoutez, je... le docteur Gay voudrait commencer. Docteur Gay, euh, vous pouvez… Euh, peut-être que euh, je n'ai pas y aller. Um, oui. Il y a des études oui. qui sont faites et qui continuent d'être faites dans beaucoup de pays. Euh, les liens que, logiques que l'on voit, c'est que le VIH euh, compromet le système immunitaire. Et jusqu'à présent aussi, avec euh, COVID, il s'est rendu compte avec tous les variants que c'est devenu beaucoup plus sévère et les formes graves, c'est les personnes qui ont un système immunitaire euh, compromis. Donc, euh, on s'attend à ce que dans les pays à, high, euh, à, un à une prévalence élevée de VIH, qu'il y ait beaucoup plus de cas graves. Um, L'autre lien que j'ai entre les variants et VIH, c'est un lien positif. Et je le disais tout à l'heure, euh, il y a 30 ans, 40 ans, euh, l'Afrique était encore touchée par une autre pandémie qui était euh, le VIH. Et, et il y avait eu beaucoup de pays comme euh, Botswana qui, à un moment, avait une proportion assez élevée, les proportions les plus élevées en matière de prévalence au VIH. Et l'Afrique du Sud qui avait le nombre brut le plus élevé en matière de VIH. Ces deux pays avaient montré une détermination à mettre une bonne partie de leur économie dans la lutte contre le VIH. Ensuite, il y a eu la solidarité internationale à travers le PEPFAR avec le gouvernement américain et le Global Fund pour l'ensemble des pays développés qui ont aidé ces pays à faire face au VIH. 
Ces pays ont développé des systèmes de surveillance très efficaces, un système de détection et de laboratoire qui n'a rien à envier aux pays développés. C'est ça aussi qui leur a permis de détecter très rapidement Omicron, de faire la séquençage et d'informer le reste du monde parce qu'ils sont restés dans les règlements sanitaires internationaux. Donc, le lien entre le VIH et euh, les variants et COVID est que c'est des pandémies. Les leçons qu'on a apprises des pandémies passées peuvent être utilisées ici et que la solidarité humaine est la seule solution pour s'en sortir. Si on ne euh, travaille pas ensemble, il n'y a aucun pays protégé tant que tous les pays ne sont pas protégés. Merci, Dr. Gay. Il y a Fadila de France Info qui demande une précision sur quelque chose que vous avez dit précédemment. Euh, non, c'est pour Dr. Migo plutôt. Donc, Falila de France TV voudrait savoir, est-ce que le chiffre que vous avez noté, c'est 40 d'Africains qui ont été en contact avec le virus et qui n'ont pas de forme grave, c'est ça? Euh, voilà, nous, nous, nous avons des, euh, des données, effectivement, qui commencent à émerger sur les différents chiffres de séro, de, des études des séroprévalences euh, qui sont euh, euh, conduites de manière globale et plus spécifiquement dans la région de, de l'Afrique. En fait, ces chiffres, effectivement, sont venus confirmer des hypothèses que nous avions déjà, que le, euh, quand on regarde le faible taux euh, de, de tests qui, qui étaient faits dans beaucoup de régions, on suspectait qu'il y avait une certaine circulation du virus euh, au sein de la population euh, de manière générale. Et effectivement, ces méta-analyses des données préliminaires, des enquêtes de séroprévalence, montrent effectivement qu'entre 40 voire jusqu'à 60 dans certains pays, euh, euh, les enquêtes de séroprévalence ont montré que ces pays étaient, les populations étaient déjà positives à, à, au SARS-CoV-2, c'est-à-dire qu'ils sont rentrés déjà en, en contact avec euh, à le virus. Euh, la grande majorité des infections, et d'ailleurs ça on le savait depuis longtemps, dans la région, euh, était que la plupart des infections chez beaucoup de personnes restaient asymptomatiques. Alors, peut-être pour euh, ajouter un dernier point sur euh, euh, l'excellente explication qu'a donnée le docteur Gay sur les liens entre euh, HIV. En ce qui concerne la vaccination, nous avons deux euh, problèmes importants que, que nous suivons de près. Euh, le, premièrement, c'est le fait que les personnes immunocompromises euh, euh, qui ont le VIH euh, ont tendance, malheureusement, à réagir à, à, à pas de manière efficiente lorsqu'ils sont vaccinés. Donc, nous, nous, nous recommandons, par exemple, qu'ils qu reçoivent des doses additionnelles de vaccins pour que, effectivement, leur réponse immunitaire, qui est généralement légèrement en, en baisse, puisse être suffisante pour également les protéger contre les formes graves de la maladie. Donc, ça reste quand même une portion de la population qui est certainement suivie de près pour être sûr que, euh, euh, ils puissent être non seulement protégés, et nous l'avons entendu dans la première partie de, euh, des interviews, que les personnes immunocompromises ont tendance à, à, à excréter, excréter plus longuement le virus euh, lorsqu'ils sont en contact par rapport aux personnes euh, euh, qui ont une immunité assez forte. Donc, ce qui fait que lorsqu'ils euh, continuent à excréter le virus de manière prolongée, ils ont tendance également, effectivement, à contaminer les autres de manière euh, plus importante. Donc, la vaccination reste, c'est vrai, un outil très important dans la protection des personnes immunocomprimées et effectivement avec des doses souvent additionnelles, ce qui fait que c'est important que cette partie de la population soit effectivement suivie de près et pour qu'elle soit protégée de manière efficiente. Merci. Et une toute dernière question. En fait, les questions nous viennent, mais là, on va bientôt arrêter la session. Donc, juste une dernière question à Dr. Migo. Après, je demanderai à Dr. Gay de conclure avec euh, ces mots. Donc, euh, de Canal Plus Afrique, Dr. Roger Moyou Mogo, euh, Canal Plus Afrique, voudrait savoir, est-ce qu'il est nécessaire de généraliser la vaccination en Afrique euh, car on a une jeune population ou bien ça serait bien de limiter aux populations à risque? À vous, Dr. Migo. Ça, effectivement, c'est une très, très bonne question. La, 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 la recommandation aujourd'hui est faite en fonction, effectivement, de, des vaccins que nous avons et des, des études qui ont été faites sur les différents types des populations, les, les résultats des essais cliniques. Et, et le plus nous avançons, le plus nous avons des données 
qui nous montre non seulement l'efficacité de ces vaccins dans les différentes tranches de population, mais surtout l'inocuité des vaccins, surtout chez les plus jeunes. Pour le moment, nous avons des recommandations maintenant assez claires pour la vaccination des jeunes adolescents avec certains vaccins où nous avons déjà maintenant des données solides qui montrent effectivement que sur le plan de l'inocuité et de l'efficacité, il n'y a aucun problème de vacciner. Par exemple, les jeunes adolescents de 12 ans et au-delà. Et nous avons déjà certains pays africains qui ont déjà commencé cette stratégie. Nous avons, je crois, quatre ou cinq pays africains qui vaccinent maintenant non seulement les personnes adultes, c'est-à-dire de 18 ans et au-delà, mais qui vaccinent également les enfants. Et la raison pour cela est claire parce que dans cette logique de couper la chaîne de transmission, on sait que les enfants, très souvent, ou les jeunes adolescents, peuvent faire la maladie, souvent des formes très bénignes, mais malheureusement peuvent continuer à transmettre la maladie dans leur environnement, y compris dans le cercle familial, souvent où ils vivent avec des personnes âgées, comme nous le savons dans la famille africaine élargie. Donc, une stratégie de vaccination des jeunes est quand même assez importante. Nous n'avons pas encore de données suffisamment solides sur la vaccination des enfants de moins de 12 ans et nous attendons des évidences là-dessus. Et finalement, est-ce qu'on devrait uniquement se limiter aux populations à haut risque Oui et non. C'est-à-dire que cette population doit être, c'est vrai, la, la cible principale de la stratégie de vaccination dans un pays, mais nous, nous avons maintenant suffisamment de vaccins pour effectivement élargir la vaccination à toutes les couches de la population, y compris maintenant les jeunes, pour essayer de effectivement couper cette transmission qui continue effectivement dans ces différentes tranches d'âge. Et je voudrais terminer réellement en disant que malgré euh, la, la, la panique, malgré euh, euh, les mois qu'a créé euh, ce nouveau variant euh, Omicron euh, au niveau euh, global, mais surtout également euh, dans nos pays africains, il est important que nous puissions continuer euh, à observer les fondamentaux qui nous ont jusque-là aidés euh, à gérer tant bien que mal cette pandémie, c'est-à-dire les mesures barrières euh, qui devront continuer, mais surtout accélérer les efforts de vaccination, effectivement, pour aider nos, nos différentes communautés à éviter les formes sévères et surtout l'hospitalisation des cas et éviter des décès dus à, à COVID-19. Merci beaucoup, Dr Migo. Et donc, je voudrais demander à Dr Abdou Salam Gay de partager son mot de fin, s'il vous plaît. Merci. Merci beaucoup Khadija et merci beaucoup à tous les journalistes qui ont participé à cette conférence de presse. Euh, des résultats qu'on a eu comme information est qu'il y a une variante euh, Omicron qui a été détectée pour la première fois en Afrique du Sud et en Botswana et qu'il y a plusieurs mutations qui sont beaucoup plus élevées que le nombre habituel que l'on trouvait chez les variants. L'infectiosité aussi euh, semble beaucoup plus importante que les variants déjà découverts actuellement. La protection que donne une infection euh, précédente semble ne pas avoir un effet complet sur ce variant. Et même aussi, ces personnes vaccinées, beaucoup de personnes qui ont eu Omicron étaient déjà vaccinées, ce qui montre que la vaccination n'a pas une protection complète. Cependant, les mesures sociales qui ont toujours été appliquées jusqu'à présent euh, continuent à marcher. Avec ces fêtes de fin d'année qui commencent à arriver, nous vous conseillons de les adopter. Prenez vos distances. Il faut porter des masques qui sont bien ajustés. Il faut aussi se laver régulièrement les mains avec du savon. Éviter les endroits où il y a beaucoup de monde et aussi où la ventilation n'est pas très bien développée. Donc, ce qu'on sait, c'est qu'en Afrique du Sud, le nombre de cas a augmenté considérablement cette semaine. Toutes les autres parties de l'Afrique, les sous-régions de l'ouest, du centre, de l'est, n'ont pas encore enregistré une augmentation de cas. Au contraire, la semaine dernière, le nombre de cas a baissé. Et nous suggérons à l'ensemble des pays de faire jouer la solidarité internationale.
et aussi de prendre des mesures qui sont basées sur le règlement sanitaire international et surtout sur des évidences, ce qui permettrait à l'ensemble de l'humanité de mieux lutter contre cette pandémie. La vaccination aussi reste encore un moyen très efficace et faites-vous vacciner. Si vous connaissez quelqu'un autour de vous qui n'est pas vacciné, essayez de le convaincre à se faire vacciner. Encore une fois, merci tout le monde d'avoir participé à cette conférence de presse. Merci, Dr. Gay, merci, Dr. Migo, et merci à tous les journalistes. Nous vous souhaitons une bonne fin de journée. Au revoir.